how these tools will evolve is leveraging other tools to kind of do more of the logic, right? So ChatGPT4, it has plugins, like you can ask it to use Wolfram Alpha, um, that sort of thing. And I think that's kind of the path that we'll need to go down where it's um, augmenting the ML AI auditor by these other tools so that it can actually do what it's good at, which is pattern recognition. GM, GM, everyone. My name's Dagash, your host of Scraping Bits. And today I'm with a special guest, Brock Elmore. How's it going? <laughs> good. Great to be here. Great to have you on. I know you're a very busy man and you've kind of just given me some time to get to know you and dive deep into the brain of Brock. So um, I think we should do a quick intro. Well, you should do a quick intro of who you are and, and what you do. Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. I am Brock Elmore. I am uh, the chief architect at Nascent. Nascent is a venture firm that we like to think of ourselves who are builders that are invested. So we invest in early stage uh, startups and uh, we, we try to also build a bunch of tooling and focus on the dev side of things. So a little bit about my background. Mm -hmm. I've been in the space full time since 2017. I actually dropped out of school to go full time starting a small fund. Then nice. early 2019 uh, did a yield aggregator kind of first of its kind. Uh, it was prior to yearn, but it was effectively the same as yearn. Couldn't do much fundraising for it at the time and then got nerd sniped into <laughs> MEV. And from there, uh, did that for a little while. And then co-founder of Nascent, Dan Elitzer, reached out mm -hmm. and said, hey, do you want to do this fun side project called Yam Finance? And oh. I said, sure. And so my brother Trent Elmore and I joined the team. Mm -hmm. And we went from idea to production in 10 days. Oh, wow. That project was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it had its <laughs> issues, but really kicked off a lot of the DeFi summer uh, yield yeah. farming activities, first food, food coin. Yeah. And then after I, I stuck around at Yam for about six months trying to write the ship after the uh, bug. Yep. And at that point, Dan reached out and was like, hey, I'm starting Nascent. Do you want to come join? And I am very entrepreneurial at heart. And so... I was very hesitant, but ultimately decided that Dan is awesome and the team that he was building around him is awesome. And so I joined as a chief architect there. And mm -hmm. so most of my day to day is building open source tools. So I was a core contributor at Foundry, um, basically helped to get off the ground. And then I recently started Pyrometer, which is a yep. um, security tool for Solidity. Uh, also put out content around security. So we, we put out simple security toolkit mm -hmm. and recently I put out an article called you're writing require statements wrong. That goes into yep. kind of a new smart contract security pattern for improving the security of your protocol. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also, you know, help our existing portfolio companies with strategic and technical issues and due diligence on on new deals. Yeah, a super exhaustive background and very interesting to say the least. This could be a massive episode just from that. <laughs> but <laughs> I would like to start off just coming from the start of your your background, getting into, you got into high frequency trading, you built a, a firm from that and you didn't finish your degree either. Were you doing computer science at the time or? I was actually a stats and operations. So I was at University of Pennsylvania Wharton undergrad doing stats primarily. And okay. I had an interest in machine learning. And so I taught myself how to code because I wanted to actually implement these machine learning models. And so I also had an interest in, in Bitcoin. And so started a yep. small firm and just kicked that off and, and um, ended up dropping out of school to do that full time. What kind of happened with that? Did you just kind of leave it or sell it? Yeah, so I, I operated it for about two years right. and then... When DeFi started to pick up, I, I was really interested in DeFi yep. and getting less and less interested in running the minutia of this very small. It was basically just me okay. and I just wanted to end it. Um, you know, investors okay. made good money from it and, uh, you know, we beat the market, but it just was not enticing me. And then basically you you went from that 
into MEV straight away or how did that kind of go? Yeah, so I went into um, starting a yield aggregator. Um, it was okay. called Topo, Topo Finance. Yep, yep, yep. We we're actually a fork of DYDX's solo margin contract. Mm -hmm. um, this was DYDX's second product. And with that fork, we basically would balance people. So I was a beta user of DYDX, this, this version two that they had. Mm -hmm. And effectively, I recognized, okay, I'm earning 49% on DYDX. Compound at the time was offering 6%. Immediately, I saw, okay, people are going to want to rebalance their, their money to go wherever has the highest yield. Yep. And so that was the start of uh, Topo for for mm -hmm. me and so started to build out the smart contracts i was not very talented it basically kicked off my solidity career as well i had a whole bunch of python experience and you know i tried yeah. to write it in viper first uh but viper at that time was very very new and didn't really support yeah. what i needed to do yep yep so fork duedx uh got it to a beta stage so the contract works it's actually still live on mainnet i think it has you know few thousand bucks in there still mm -hmm. uh just from beta users but while i was building that and thinking about okay. the liquidations of my system being built on top of these other systems because we actually not only supported the the lending side we also supported the borrowing side so optimize yep. rates on the borrowing side and so as i was thinking through the liquidation process and and oracles and whatnot i actually discovered uh back running before right. it was called back running yeah so in the early I don't days know if, yeah I don't know if people are familiar with back running, but effectively when you have an Oracle update, um, that Oracle update is what kind of triggers an account to be liquidatable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I built a system and, and discovered that you could basically be in the same block mm -hmm. and as the uh, as the Oracle update by looking at the mempool. Um, and at the time that was like, no one was doing that. And so yeah. that led to my brother and I, um, who was working with me on this, uh, being the largest liquidator on DYDX for probably about five months. Yeah, with no competition. And yeah, we basically had no competition. You know, the market, the MEV market adapted relatively quickly. And, you know, Geth was changing at the time. They introduced FIFO, uh, first in, first out, which changed the game. And it, it became this spam game effectively. Uh, and we really just didn't like playing that spam game. So we expanded our horizons and started to explore more MEV opportunities. Yeah. So then after basically this MEV kind of phase, what, what did you kind of pivot to after that? Yeah, so we we're actually still doing MEV. So Oh, interesting. <laughs> for for a little while until so we, we would, you know, be doing uh, balancer at the time, you know, comp yeah. tokens were getting distributed and whatnot. And there's a f function on balancer pools called gulp where basically if yep. there were extra tokens that weren't claimed, you could uh, call this function gulp, which would distribute the extra tokens per rata to all the token holders. And so mm -hmm. we would do flash loans and whatnot to basically capture all of the gulpable comp tokens and whatnot. But, you know, we were, and so we were doing things like that as well as a whole bunch of other random MEV games. There was mm -hmm. uh, pretty much at that time, it was like you look at a protocol and you, you could basically just find money um if you're smart and <laughs> like can read the code yeah and that kind of war on us like our infrastructure was designed for liquidation it was not designed for doing a whole bunch of random activities on chain yep. that we ended up doing um and so i was getting pretty burnt out and at that time dan elitzer uh and will price reached out mm -hmm. dan's co-founder of nascent will price is a extremely smart guy uh just been in the space for a while mm -hmm. and came to my brother and i saying hey we have this idea for what ended up being YAM. Uh, it was yeah. a rebasing token with, you know, we were looking at Ample and we said, you know, we'll yeah. make this better, a treasury that set a floor to kind of how far this could go down and that sort of thing. And so mm -hmm. um, we went from idea to production in 10 days. Yeah, quite fast. Quite fast. And obviously that had kind of a downside. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, we ended up having a bug in that contract when it was getting really big as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we, by day two, we had 750 million in our staking contracts and it kicked off the food coin craze and yeah. a lot of oh, man. DeFi, DeFi summer, um, in 20, 
uh, 20. So yeah, how did you basically go about that bug that came in um, when it was live, basically? Yeah, what was interesting about Yam is it was a fair launch. Us as individuals, we had no control over the system at all. Yeah. And so what we determined the best course of action was, was to get basically everyone in the community to delegate their yam to me so that we could get governance passed as soon as governance was enabled and try and get a proposal through and fix some of the bugs uh, or fix the bug. And so that kicked off what was called save yam. Um, <laughs> it was quite the quite the movement. Everyone, yeah. you know, I talk to people now and they say how much fun they had during that time. Um, I'm yeah. glad other people had fun because boy, was it stressful for me. Yeah, I can imagine. It was like the golden age of crypto, I think. Yeah, it was it was a lot, a lot of fun. But ultimately, the, the bug didn't work due to some technical details on compound governance tokens, quorum requirements, mm-hmm. and the rebasing. And so yeah. effectively, the bug fix didn't work. And But what it did kick off for me personally is a, you know, we did have tests uh, mm-hmm. for our contracts, but we're using Truffle at the time. Oh, man. Yeah. Hard Hat was still in its early days. Um, it was called Builder at the time. And uh, Dapp Tools was there in the background, but not really something that um, like I knew about mainstream. or many people knew about. Yeah. But then uh, Mariano from uh, Maker mm-hmm. reached out and said, hey, I think you might be interested in Dapp Tools. And so he ended up getting me Dapp Tool pilled, uh, which eventually led to uh, the formation of, of Foundry as it is today you had like a problem of okay testing suites aren't really there yet and then luckily yep. that that tools was there and you you kind of captured the opportunity um at, at a yep. prime time and then basically help build foundry to what it is now basically a titan in in the in the industry and basically the standard of testing yeah yeah and i, I can talk about how kind of foundry came to be if if you want um yeah sure yeah, I guess also uh, like difficulties going through and building this. Yeah. Um, so I, it, my first interaction with Dapp Tools was this is awesome. And then I started using fork tests, um, which are pretty commonplace these days. But yeah. on Dapp Tools, they were exceedingly slow, like m- molasses. It was absurd how <laughs> slow they were. And so I looked at that and I was like, okay, I'm just going to rewrite. Dapp tools in Rust. And so I wrote something called, I think it's still archived on my GitHub, but called Rust CEVM. So Rust Composability EVM. Basically, it was um, Dapp tools. So I could use all of, like, basically the same testing infrastructure, well, mm-hmm. same tests, uh, but run it a bunch, a lot faster via my Rust implementation. Yep, and so yep. that was like the precursor to Foundry. And so when Giorgio saw that on my, and it was just something I used. It wasn't it wasn't very public. Like, yes, it was on my GitHub, but no one else was using it. It was not production ready in any capacity. Yeah. It was just, I need a tool. I'm going to go build the tool and build something that I need. And so Giorgio's reached out. Uh, we, you know, we had been friends and, and chatted uh, quite a bit. And he saw that and was like, yo, we should productionize this and, and mm-hmm. make it something that everyone can use. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was, I was too busy with other things. And I was like, yeah, I agree we should, but I don't really want to kind of lead that charge in the open source uh, issues that yeah. are associated. Um, Cause maintaining open source is a bit um, of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he kicked off a lot of the core work on it. And then um, I built up a, m- a bunch of features mm-hmm. for my, you know, DAP tools alternative and Rust. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, basically brought all of that over into Foundry. And so like the tracing, so anytime you add, add like dash Vs to your your Foundry mm-hmm. test, Forge test, um, I built that. I built the debugger. I built gas reports, uh, mm-hmm. helped build the fuzzer. Um, so a lot of the core components in Foundry uh, were directly from kind of my output. Um, yeah. Not to like... there. There are a ton of super other talented developers that did it, that, that worked on Foundry, mm-hmm. Georgios especially, uh, Matt um, and Onberg, uh, Oliver. They were very foundational and built all of this infrastructure that makes Foundry what it is today. I built mm-hmm. a few features on top um, that kind of are, are core to the user experience, but yep. um, it's definitely a team effort. For sure, yeah. And it's quite interesting that you did all the tracing and the fuzzing um 
did you have any prior experience to basically building all this stuff? Um, basically, no. It was how you got your experience, right? Yeah, I, I just saw what I, I just basically looked at the existing tools and was like, mm -hmm. this is good, but I generally have a pretty good understanding of what I want. And yeah. I view myself as a very good customer, right? Yeah. So I am probably a good proxy for what other people want as well. And so just kind of leaned on that fact to gotcha. generate these features. Yeah, and how did you go about basically getting these traces? Because you obviously need an RPC, so you had to learn about nodes, right? And then for Fuzzy, you had to go into basically dynamic analysis and all that. Yeah. These routes uh, gets quite deep, right? So I think we should start with basically the tracing first and then dive into yeah. the other one. Yeah, so with tracing, um, that kind of actually... So we we do tracing differently in than like how Geth does it necessarily. So okay. Foundry, you interact directly with the EVM. Actually, you don't have an RPC. And so what it actually okay. did is actually gave me a ton of experience understanding the EVM. So yeah. I would say that's how I really learned what the EVM is doing under the hood. And so, uh, you know, I had a vision for this is the end product. Yeah. And then I just dove into the EVM code base and figured out, okay, this is the data structure that I need. This is how I can build up the data along the way to recognize the calls and, yep. and that sort of thing. And this was the GIF uh, node, right? That you're you're looking in for reference. Uh, so technically, it was this Rust implementation of the EVM called Sputnik. Um, okay. I believe it's what some of the Ethereum Classic people were using. So it wasn't even a mainstream like node that everyone was using. It was just kind of like some side one that you just found. Yeah, it was. Like, oh, this is. It cool. was just a EVM implementation. Um, cool in rust and uh i had used it for rust to evm and so i kind of learned the evm via looking through that repo and yeah. understanding it and mm -hmm. kind of just trial know, and error right tri trial and error and think about okay this is how i plug into this you, you know consuming it as a library forking it uh adding what i needed and using my fork and then with the fuzzing how, how did you go about that? Because that's a completely different field to EVM in general. So did you yeah. have any prior experience to that? Or was it just, you know what, I need this? <laughs> you know, on the fuzzing side, it wasn't just me to be clear, but there's an existing... So again, it was it was looking at what libraries are out there. As much as I like, you know, reinventing the wheel, mm -hmm. there's a case to be made like, hey, just go take what's off the shelf and get something that works well. Good. And so there's a Rust crate called uh, Prop Test, oh, and yep. so we we leveraged Prop Test inside of uh, Foundry mm -hmm. and kind of went that way with it. Just oh, yeah, I also right? yeah. And so uh, I would say most of my contributions on the fuzz were actually making it more intelligent, right? So right. for some context, fuzzing it's generating random inputs, uh, but ideally you want to generate you know best guesses. Yeah, uh, and we can talk a little bit about how to make those guesses better, um, mm -hmm. and that kind of goes into the program analysis side of things. And so my my first improvement was like, all right, what if we just if you think about your code and you have like an if statement, if x is greater than a hundred, yeah. right, and x is some input to the function, mm -hmm. just reading the bytecode for pushes, right, you see a push one hundred, mm -hmm. those push values are actually generally going to be important to your contract and the and the control flow of your contract. And so, yep. you know, pulling those out, adding them to a dictionary and keeping those in mind for using the fuzzer, uh, using yep. as inputs for the fuzzer. And so it was, it was a lot of thinking about the what the fuzzer is doing and trying to have it generate more intelligent inputs um, mm -hmm. and any tricks and hacks I could do to make that better. Yeah, and the only way you can really do this is by understanding the contracts at a deep level. If you can't read and write basically at the lowest level, then you're not going to understand how to build something that's automating this in a specific way for, I guess, niches within or like unique kind of identifiers in the lowest level. Uh, as you said, like these pushes, let's say that was followed by a jump or a jump I, then you obviously know then it's, it's a, it's a hard-coded basically jump test. Uh, just to yep. where it's going to go. So you could basically gather all those um, and then you can have some, kind of like a jump 
jump table in memory or something. But I guess it gets way more harder when you have dynamic variables and people, you know, they make custom bytecode, right? And then you have dynamic, basically jumps and jump eyes. And I guess that's when it gets super complex, but it's definitely a great first step. And obviously what was essential for Solidity, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, my most recent work is on something called Pyrometer, which is, it's uses what's called abstract interpretation. Mm -hmm. So it reads your Solidity code and um, and it's a mix between symbolic execution, I would say, and kind of uh, static analysis. It's it's a mix of a few different things, right? Where mm -hmm. you're, it's almost symbolic execution, where you're going through the control flow of your program, uh, but you're not running it on an EVM, a small EVM, or whatnot. You're yep. you're just looking at the code, and let's say you have X, and you do a require statement that X is less than a hundred. And so, mm -hmm. what Parameter does is it now knows that if X was a unit two fifty six. X has to be within zero and 99, right? If yep. X is less than a hundred. Um, and so now we know, okay, uh, X is in, it's symbolic, but it's bounded variables. And so kind of bringing this back to the fuzzing side of things and, and what I'm currently building with Pyrometer is you can take all of this information and, you know, if there's an if statement to reach this code path or an else to reach this other code path, we actually now know uh, in very easy to understand constraint system where it says X has to be zero to 99 um, to reach this or in mm -hmm. this other code path is 100 and above. We can actually now plug that information into the fuzzer mm -hmm. and make sure that we get close to as close to 100% code coverage as we can. And mm -hmm. there's a fuzzing benchmark put out by consensus called uh, data Yep. And it's basically this maze system that uh, comes from traditional fuzzing in, in, you know, traditional software to benchmark fuzzers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Foundry right now is kind of number two in this benchmark. Harvey, which is consensus's yeah, uh, closed, closed source. Forward. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Gray, I think it's a um... gray box yeah. fuzzer. Um, I think they do some relatively similar stuff, but um, and then Echidna's third right now. But with Pyrometer, we'll be able to basically solve data laws in it, what we're hoping is we'll be able to like really improve Foundry's fuzzers so that will be best in class by far. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. Having an open source, basically testing suite with an elite fuzzer, that'd be better than yep. <laughs> the closed source specifically yep. built for tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah and super interesting. Ideally, how this, if you're a Foundry user, eventually you'll just be able to run Foundry up and all of a sudden your fuzzer will just be 10 times better than it was, uh, which I think is, is super cool. Um, it's going to be very interesting, but obviously having an open source, these closed source projects, you'll be able to see um, and try and iterate on them. How did you get from basically fuzzing to static analysis? Uh, because they're two different things and you basically built Pyrometer after you did fuzzing. So why did you choose to go down the static analysis route instead of dynamic? Um, it really came from, ironically, I had um, about like five or six different ideas for public good tools that I wanted to see in the world. And I ran a Twitter poll saying, hey, what should I go build? And people voted yep. for the Solidity Security tool. And basically it came from uh, this idea that if you're auditing code or looking at code, the I have found some very strange like overflow bugs and whatnot that it feels mm. like it should be easier to find those. Right. Um, and so it came from this idea, well, we have all this type information and we have these require statements. Mm -hmm. It should be easier to know what the bounds are at any given point for any given variable. And yep. that's what Pyrometer does under the hood. Yep. It, as I said, right, the require uh, X is less than 100. It keeps track of this. And so it came from a need of, oh, I need to understand where overflows may happen. I need to understand what are the total, like Polygon had some bug where basically you could transfer as much Matic that the zero I just had based on ECD, ECDSA, basically EC recover can return zero, right? And wanting to know, okay, what are the possible addresses that 
could come out of this function. Like if you're calling transfer, what could the from address be and this sort of thing. And so uh, that's what Pyrometer can do under the hood. It can highlight this for you and say, yes, this value can possibly be zero. And that's bad. Yep. Because addresses uh, are basically just a bound of zero bytes to 20 bytes. And in yep. hex, those are all basically numeric values. So that's how it really works. It's just basically yep. finding the lowest value it can possibly be and also the highest value it can possibly be. The more, I guess, constraints that come along using the same value, you can kind of narrow that down even more and make this tool more efficient so you're not waiting for unnecessary iterations that aren't even going to be hitting any new code coverage basically yes because all it comes yeah. down to with these tools is time complexity and how can you minimize that while getting the most amount of coverage possible um, so bound analysis is a terrific technique to basically get that and there's obviously other techniques as well which you have in your to-do list which like taint analysis as well which i think is terrific i've built that out um, that was kind of like my first technique i've ever used you quote unquote taint something or in a better context, diet, let's say, let's do like a data stream or a stream of water per se. You can basically put like red dye into it and that would be a specific opcode. And then after that opcode, you can see what that tainted one or one that we dyed red influences. And so the data stream, or in this case, the water, you can see where the red dye is going and you can see what's being influenced in, I guess, the data flow, which would be the future opcodes that are being used by that original red dyed one. Um, and it's just stuff like this that basically gets you to be more efficient and reduce the time complexity. So yeah, yeah and you, you exactly. also do symbolic execution in it as well. So how do you use that in Pyrometer? Yeah, so instead of, so that's like a concrete case, right? So where mm -hmm. the values are hard coded in ours, right, in, in Pyrometer, you can kind of think of it as, I, I guess, think of it more like Slither, where mm -hmm. in Slither, you, it's the best way to explain it, I would say, in the context of like taint analysis, is we offer better pattern matching and more powerful pattern matching. Um, sure. Well, not not yet. Kind of where we're taking it yep, is yep. Um, we, we construct a DAG under the hood um, okay. that is, you know, this variable. Uh, flows into this variable mm -hmm. and you know there's these relationships between these and they're all nodes in this graph and so what that allows you to do is actually query based on what we're going to probably implement something called cypherlang mm -hmm. which is a graph querying language and so in slither where you have to write uh, python do kind of iterate through all these their intermediate representation their ir in pyrometer you'll be basically, basically just be able to ask um you know variable as an input to a function, um, then the output, yada, yada, yada. And, and yep. basically be able to detect, okay, you called this other contract. It gave you some value back and you're not actually checking that value. So now that's considered tainted, right? That value is tainted until you do validation on it, yep. making sure that it, you know it's within your parameters that you think it's going to return or, or that the... Uh, if it spits about back out an address and you're going to call that address, right? So it's using the tainted value. Um, yep. And so with Pyrometer, it's, it's basically we have a, a mock-up of what that query would look like. And it's, you know, two lines of what's called cypherlang um, mm -hmm. that is pretty understandable. You know, this node connects to this node via this um, property. So... Um, yeah, stuff like that is quite interesting <laughs> with that taint analysis um, technique. It, for example, if let's say we're using Uniswap and we're checking, uh, I guess, the reserves, for example, um, and something depends on this, I guess, in an oracle sense, it depends on it um, for pricing. One way you could check for a vulnerability of, I guess, oracle manipulation would be to check basically, okay, this, our core contract relies on the reserves of this Uniswap pool and we have basically a condition that says, okay, Uniswap reserves have to be above this amount. And then I know token A, token B amounts have to be above basically X amount. So they're like ratioed in the right way. Um, and that that's a way of basically doing the same, like taint analysis is what, is what you explained, right? Um, 
Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it's it's kind of before the fact, right? You want to make sure, mm-hmm. right? So if you're an auditor and you're looking at a code base, if you, and, you know, we mentioned a little bit before the call about code arena's bot races. And so, you know, allowing auditors to speed through this process, design their own uh, patterns and whatnot in a simple way, I think will um, be super powerful for users. And, you know, it, on the kind of Oracle side, I recently put out a, a pattern called a security pattern called F R E I Pi. You know, free Pi, free Pi. However, you want to say the first part. It's like an expansion on checks effects interactions, um, yep. but it stands for function requirements effects interactions plus protocol invariance. And uh, you know, so I like to attack security not just from a dev tooling side, but also content creation and thinking through sort of the, a whole bunch of the issues associated with uh, smart contract security um, mm-hmm. and trying to help developers write more secure contracts because we can't keep having uh, billions of dollars hacked every year. <laughs> yeah. Um, what kind of made, made you go down the open source route instead of making, I, I guess, a company and then a SaaS and selling it instead, <sighs> kind of just like helping he- the community instead of, taking yeah um, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i it's thankfully i'm in a very privileged position where um you know at nascent we are a venture team and we do some liquid stuff as well but yep. um the venture side is the all of that depends on the space going Please mainstream go. and so anything we can do as a company to help the space become more mature and, and mm-hmm. more secure that we just get a whole bunch of positive externalities, but also additionally, I just have a personal belief in open source goods. I think public goods are extremely important and awesome. And so mm-hmm. I personally, as well as the entire company is super aligned with that. But that mm-hmm. being said, right, if I were on my own, not a part of nascent, I would absolutely be looking at ways to do monetization and, and this and that. And, you know, there are a bunch of the th- things that, like in the Twitter poll, most of those I'm fairly confident I could convert into a real like product. a startup, basically. But yeah. yeah, as a startup. But I'm in a privileged position where, you know, my the money I make is not dependent on that product. It's dependent on the space growing. And mm-hmm. so um, if I can, and I just get a whole bunch of warm fuzzy feelings by putting something good out into the world (laughs) yeah but i i'm fully supportive of people who do want to create a product around these sorts of issues and and but it it really comes down to seeing a need and attacking that need with kind of intuition about yourself how you would want to see this product and going after it that way yeah, and now that you've kind of built parameter, uh, pyrometer, and solved the, the basically the problem you initially had, well, to a degree, you still have a lot more to go on the roadmap. Yep. But I guess apart from that, and when it's done, what do you think is missing from the security tooling space at the moment? And if you could bring that tool into existence, what would it be? I see a lot of uh, sort of AI startups around this, and basically just improving the what you can do as a pre-audit right so we put out um nascent we and i helped write this uh the simple security toolkit and it basically has you know a pre-audit checklist and an incident response plan and this and that and really i think improving the pre-audit flow and pushing more and more of the things that an auditor will do that you're paying them six figures for a lot of times to do pushing more of that down into the developer life cycle of I'm starting a project. I'm going to use this product to make sure I am ready for audit because the number one thing that scares me the most is when a protocol gets audited and there's a bunch of high vulnerabilities and then they go, (laughs) get another audit and there's still a bunch of high vulnerabilities. It's like, okay, I I basically will never trust that protocol, even though they've been audited twice, three times or whatever, purely based on the fact that there's been so many uh, vulnerabilities in it at that point. And so as far as 
concrete tools, I'm not exactly sure. I think it, you know, my focus has been very much on pyrometer recently. And so I'm sure I'll cook something up in the not too distant future of, you know, being in an audit, reviewing code and saying, oh, I need this tool to improve my workflow. And then pushing that out, either making it a product or that sort of thing. And I think AI can help with that. I don't think we're there yet. And I'm very uh, skeptical of any of the existing products out there currently. I think they're on a good track, but um, personally, I wouldn't pay for anything before trying to use it. Um, you know, I saw some protocol, I won't name names. They said, we've been audited by ChatGPT4. And I'm like, yeah, sir, that is not an audit. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of um, ChatGPT4 and also your machine learning background, I wonder um, how you see the kind of smart contract security sector now in its direction um, as it's highly methodological and involves pattern recognition, which are, are both strong skills of AI. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I think, you know, if you look at ChatGPT4, its logic has improved, but um, mm -hmm. I think really kind of the sweet spot of how these tools will evolve is leveraging other tools to kind of do more of the logic, right? So right. ChatGPT4, it has plugins, like you can ask it to use Wolfram Alpha, um, that sort of thing. And I think that's kind of the path that we'll need to go down where it's um, augmenting the, the you know, ML AI auditor mm -hmm. via these other tools. So plugging the output of Pyrometer into ChatGPT4, I think is a potential path or, you know, whatever tool you're building um, just to give it more context and offload some of the heavy logic so that it can actually do what it's good at, which is pattern recognition. I think and, it is. And a, I think, oh, yeah. continue, sir. Yeah, since like machine learning and AI is really like basically great at pattern recognition, and that's basically what auditing is, and then coming up with basically how to attack this, I guess AI would be great for understanding business logic. Kind of the only thing you can't really automate in a meaningful way because it does require human interpretation. And that's what AI is good for. It, it is great at pattern recognition and interpretation, but I think in pre-deployment, it would be quite useful. But I wonder what kind of mindset will be needed for post-deployment, which I don't think anybody's really working on, apart from myself and Pentestify. Uh, that's all I know about. What do you think about post-deployment, auditing, automation? <laughs> yeah, post-deployment's really, it, it definitely is, sort of underserved, I would say the only real, the, there's sort of the immune five post, post deployment audit in a sense where you can view a high bug bounty as an ongoing post deployment audit in a sense. And then there are a few like scanning the mempool and trying to front run. Um, so there's a company called Skylock, you know, they're trying to analyze the mempool and basically uh, run front, run, front run hacks to make them white hat. And so I think there's definitely room for more post audit or post, post deployment tooling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a good sense of what it looks like though, besides kind of the, the big honey pot of, of money or, you know, the big pot of gold <laughs> at the end of the rainbow of, yeah. of finding a hack and hopefully you know, if you're a hacker, you uh, see the the bounty and you're like, that entices me more than, you know, doing a black hat, black hat hack and potentially going to prison. But yeah, it's a it's an interesting area. Yeah, it's definitely not worth having the government in the whole world in your back for the rest of your life. I think yeah, there's even be like stories of someone like black hatting and then six years later they get arrested when they think they're in, yep. the, in the free. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Don't recommend it. Um, yeah. But it's also interesting. You could classify black hats as a long tail MEV, I guess, or the way yeah. you do it. I mean, we've seen generalized front runners accidentally uh, right? yeah. <laughs> front, front run uh, hacks before. And so it is, and it, it'll be interesting to see how that space evolves for sure. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a gray area for sure. Because um, I guess there's different ways of doing a black hat as well. It's, of course, you could take millions at the same time at like one atomic transaction, but you could also just take little by little and it kind of looks like a long tail opportunity, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
so um, it's it would be hard to I don't know, kind of gauge this in a way because all MEV is technically an exploit to some degree. <laughs> <laughs> not not all MEV, most of MEV, like a lot of MEV is you know, and at least an abuse of intents, right? So intents right. are, are hot these <laughs> days, and under users leaving their intents underspecified effectively. Um, and speaking about like post deployment auditing, one advantage about it is you already have an initialized state. Um, so I wonder how people basically initialize their state pre-deployment for audits um, without, I guess, unit tests, right? So I guess how would you go about that kind of going around it? Like you don't have any co kind of context to go off. So let's say, for example, Uniswap, uh, let's say there were pre-deployment needed an audit, but you don't have any context or any any tests, right? So I guess how do you kind of build build that context for your proof of concept kind of attack contract. Mm. So you're saying pre-audit, basically initializing yeah. what the contract is going to look like uh, once it's deployed. Yeah, exactly. But without any reference, basically, <laughs> or any help. No reference. Yeah. No, so you, you don't have access to like the repo and the deploy scripts and stuff? No, yeah, you do, but um, okay. maybe not the deploy yeah. scripts. <laughs> okay. Um, cause I was going to say, I, I helped design the, uh, forge scripts. Um, you know, it's mostly my brainchild and implemented by, uh, Joshi. And I think, you know, if you are for my context, is this in, in, you are an auditor or you're a kind of what, what hat should I put on here? Um, when evaluating this, I mean, we can do a gray hat, your best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah. It brings up an interesting thought, like auditors leaving bugs on the table because they know there's going to be a bug bounty and they'll make more from the bug bounty than uh you know just submitting it during the audit um yeah i think but, um like a common thing i would see or yeah just like if someone didn't have a test in let's say a public contest and you don't know basically the initialized state then how will you make a, a proof of concept um it's basically create an attack contract and show them that there's actually an exploit um because you don't have, you know, this swelled state that's already there. Yeah, yeah, that can be difficult. I think just like the best thing you can do is write, you know, a Forge script that deploys what you're expected. Like you make assumptions about what the state of the world right. is and, and going from there, right? So you, you say, all right, I'm assuming that you're going to deploy this uh, with these parameters yep. based on whatever information you have. And then given that assumption this is how you would exploit it you know if i were to personally do this i would do it all in forge script with a foundry proof of concept thing yeah um usually the best way a little biased but <laughs> of course yeah i think that's definitely the way you would have to basically read the code and understand it to the point where you would have to deploy it let's say you're now the owner of this contract and then go through that and basically mock up an initialized state uh, I guess for, let's say, a Uniswap pool, then you would have to basically get these tokens and adhere to the formula, um, have the perfect ratio and whatnot, um, yeah. and then go from there. Hopefully, there's enough liquidity to do what you want to do with a swap, um, but that's how you would do it. And I've that's been a kind of something that's been on my mind, and how would you automate that as well? So you don't have to keep initializing all these protocols. Um, so. Yeah, and, and you know, Foundry has fork tests, so a fork of mainnet. So basically, it uses an RPC under the hood to read state from mainnet. And like, so if you have a S load of a contract that exists on mainnet, it'll actually reach it. out via RPC, grab it from um, a real node, and uh, use that as the state inside the um, EVM. And so. I've I've used that a ton um, yeah, yeah. for all sorts of things. It's um, such a great feature, and I think people even like getting into that and learning like the depths of it, um, how it works. I'm pretty sure it just caches the state at that at that block, right? Yep, yep. You Under specify the, the the block you want to yep. use as as the state, um, and then in combination with Forge Standard, which I I wrote, um, it has we have something called Deal, um, and mm -hmm. so it's yeah. a basically a cheat code that lets you, um, if you do vm.deal, it will give you ether. But then if you just do standard cheat steal, it can basically give you any ERC-20. And it does that by another cheat code called 
accesses and yeah. records and it records all of the all of the state access accesses and then um we do some interesting things to kind of okay you read slot four by this call we can now go write that and then check the function again so if it's balance of right we'll call one balance of mm -hmm. uh then you can do a write and then we'll check it again and make sure it updated correctly and so you can give yourself um even on these fork main nets or mm -hmm. fork fork tests you can give yourself uh, as much die as you want effectively yeah. or USDC or pretty much any token. There's some caveats with this. It doesn't yeah, work yeah. for things with packed uh, balance um, mm -hmm. state and that sort of thing, but um, yeah. it's very powerful. Emulation is is quite an interesting field for me as well. Um, I guess in the, in the realm of program analysis, it's, it's quite fun to play around with. Um, but there are two more questions or three more questions maybe. Hopefully we can crown them in, but um, yeah. What field do you kind of see as the most lucrative yet unexplored in the crypto world? Let's say ZK Z, uh, or, or security, something like that around the lines. But yeah, in your opinion, what, what do you think? It's interesting. I, I think... Um, Even in terms of tooling as well, like being early in tooling, et cetera. Yeah, I think in the broader crypto ecosystem, there's, you know, I would say most alt L1s have mostly stopped being able to raise a massive amount. Now it's uh, layer twos and ZK. And so if you're looking at startup, but it's also extremely competitive where yeah. you have a ton of startups in those spaces. And so, yeah. you know, we at Nascent, we've done some ZK stuff. We've done, you know, we're invested in optimism. And so I think those are really interesting. I think there's just a ton of competition, but also if you win, it is massive. Um, yeah, of course. And uh, I guess that kind of like is a segue into basically what you look look at uh, as kind of like a VC slash, yeah, uh, investors. What, what do you kind of, what's the criteria for finding a perfect investment or something that has potential? Yeah, first and foremost, it's generally the founder. Like, right. do we, do they pass the vibe check? You know, are they values aligned, right? Yeah. Do they actually get the crypto e ethos and mm -hmm. what Ethereum is all about? Um, you know, we, we'll dabble in Cosmos and um, as well, but we generally like to stick around um, the Ethereum space and uh, we love uh, infrastructure. We love DeFi mm -hmm. um, and security. Uh, you know, we're investors in Spearbit, Code Arena, yep. Macro. And so then it's about sort of the, you know, where I specialize in is sort of the technical diligence. Um, you know, yep. we always, I always hop on the call and um, just have a blast with founders getting to chat about what they're doing technically, how they're thinking yeah. about things from a technical perspective. Um, and that really resonates with founders a lot of times. And so I've, I really enjoy that aspect. And so just making sure the technical side is there, uh, whether it's the founder or people around the founder, yeah. uh, Doves. just making sure that they they can execute on, on their vision. Um, sure. yeah. And the idea obviously matters as well, making sure it's, you know, they're not doing something where we instantly are like, why are you even... Going after <laughs> yeah. this, this is has to be an investable idea. Uh, yeah, another NFT. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you're a fork of Uniswap v2. Sick. Uh, Perfect. no thanks. Put um, some Master <laughs> Jeff on there. Perfect. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, I would like to diverge this a little bit to kind of personality slash how you think. Um, so I guess to start off as, as like a lead, um, in architecture, how much do you code versus how much do you think about kind of what needs to be coded? It's interesting. I would say it, it bounces back and forth. You know, a lot of the initial side of things is thinking broadly about kind of, it, it even transcends the technical side of things. And it's thinking almost in like a product manager style role about like, right. what, what does the product actually need to do? And then, okay, here's kind of the sketch for how to execute that. Right. Uh, and then it's about coding. And so you, when I am talking with founders and whatnot, then I definitely have more of the, you know, thinking through things and, yep, and yep. architectural um, design choices. H how do you architect the system to make it gas efficient? Um, right. You know, it's not something we talked about much today, but I have historically done a ton of gas optimizations. And, and so it really 
depends on what stage of the product, what stage the product is in and, and figuring out from there. Yeah. For an example, let's say pyrometer. Um, what was the process of kind of thinking about, okay, I have this problem. Here's a solution. How do we basically build this out step by step to get to the end goal? Yeah. Um, it basically started as I have this problem. Uh, let me, th and I just kind of ruminated on the problem for a while and eventually it came to me, oh, this would be the solution to do it, or this would be a solution to it. And then from once I had the solution, it was, okay, I need the conviction to go and execute on it. Mm -hmm. And then once I started, once I had that conviction, I just started coding and coding and coding. And so then, you know, as I'm coding, new ideas pop up, here's how this could be expanded, that sort of thing. But I kind of mostly kept a lot of that stuff on the side and just kept them in the back of my head while I executed on the current vision, trying to reduce scope creep um, until mm -hmm. uh, actually ready for those new features. Yeah, so you basically just create like an MVP of what was completely ne like necessary uh, and then yeah. start iterating on that, right? Yeah, see if this is even possible. Because um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even, I didn't know if it was, if it was going to be possible. I had an idea um, and I yeah. got something that worked on, you know, a single contract and then I got it to work. And then I expanded, okay, now I can support these Solidity features and, and et cetera, et cetera. And so now we support most Solidity features. There is some absolutely cursed Solidity out there though. <laughs> oh, man. The initial pop up on the repo. I'm like, I didn't even know that was valid Solidity. <laughs> You can do, let's say you have an array. You can do dot push with empty insert, like n n nothing in the uh, parentheses yeah. equals some value. And I, I didn't know that, right? Like, oh, wow. why, why yeah. would you do that? I didn't know, but uh, apparently you can, which is quite strange. Yeah, th this is why I kind of went into like the byte code level. Um, it just yeah. kind of skipped yeah. all, the, <laughs> all the compiler stuff yeah. and oh, I don't want to deal with that. The, I'll get right to the nitty yeah, gritty. Yeah, like that's what Sertora does, right? So they're a formal yeah. verification and they, it's very common for these kinds of tools to go down into uh, the bytecode, but yeah, it kind of, what I wanted to do with Pyrometer is surface some of these code insights to the developer, to the person reading. Cause yeah. if you just go to the bytecode, yeah, it's great for actually finding like automated bugs, yep. but it doesn't allow you to give context to the developer the person sitting in front of the computer it either is just like yeah we found a bug no we didn't find a bug um and so i think the kind of back and forth of mm -hmm. make a change see what actually is happening to my bounds or and whatnot that can be a very useful thing uh sure. now yeah. the user experience of that is very challenging and and i have ideas for improving it because if you use pyrometer today it'll probably work in a contract it may not highly experimental it's highly experimental, but then the output, if you have a super large repo, it's just, it's massive. And so yeah. um, mm -hmm. trying to balance that user experience can be challenging. Yeah, I've talking, I've spoken to a, a few people that have used Pyrometer and that, that was kind of like the biggest pitfall right now is just for like a, a large contract or just even a normal size contract, it's just the visual yeah. representation is like, overflows the screen and it's just kind of hard yeah. to read yeah. even though it's a great tool it's just the yeah. conveying information part which is the hard part to do yep and this is why we're in beta and whatnot like have ideas to improve that and like it should still be as like a, a kind of foundation for a lot of extra tools built on top like the fuzzer and the like other static analysis type stuff so yeah it's all um, there but it, it's, yeah. it's getting there right yeah and just like the final question before I let you go, I want to know how you basically schedule your day and basically have an optimal kind of a, a route for a successful, successful day and having great progress. Maybe you have a schedule of some sorts, but you wake up at a certain time or you eat a certain way, all that kind of stuff. I, I want to know about that so you can become optimal. Yeah. So I generally am a relatively early riser, you know, 7 a.m. or so, and I drink green tea. I've stopped drinking coffee um, for the most part. And uh, <laughs> I, I find it's, you get the caffeine benefit without any of the kind of jitteriness or anything like that. And so mm -hmm. um, I don't have breakfast. I, I skip breakfast and, and just wait till lunch. And, you know, my 
days are relatively on the venture side, right? I have to hop on calls with founders and, you know, we have our team calls and that sort of thing. And so I try to only take calls and meetings on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm -hmm. um, so that my Tuesdays and Thursdays, I can be heads down building and coding the right. products that I want to um, build and code. And so I find that to be, and I, I do still code on, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday as well, but yeah. uh, no, trying I to just this. like, shh, yeah, yeah, you know, I I very much am unable to, all right, I have a meeting and then I have a 30 minute break, then I have another meeting. Yeah. Like that 30 minutes is mostly dead to me. Um, and so <laughs> trying to optimize my day to where it's okay, all my meetings are before noon mm -hmm. and uh, it's just back to back to back. And then the afternoon I have free to kind of dive into code and, and get yep. in that flow. Yeah. And while I'm an early riser, like my natural tendency is to go late at night. Um, I am married, so that doesn't okay. work so much uh, for <laughs> me anyway, anymore. So I, I do still try and just like, if I'm in a zone, I try and stay in the zone as long as I can. Sometimes I'll skip lunch. Sometimes I'll skip dinner. Uh, like I just try when I'm in a zone, I try to not let anything derail right, me because yeah. when I'm in that zone, I am one of the most productive people, uh, period where it's just, I can kick something out faster than a lot of people. And so mm -hmm. that's where I like to get to. It's really hard to get to that, that flow. It's yeah. a combination of motivation and having that space and time to dive deep. Yeah, zero distractions. With just like even a couple of hours of this flow state, you can really accomplish a lot more than what people can accomplish in a couple of days. <laughs> so it's, yep. it's highly, um, I guess, lucrative in, in that sense. Yeah. And you should always try and yep. cater your day towards building this, this flow state. Um, and that's also what I've done. I've tried to do that in the past. I've done like one meal per day, fasted even three days straight at one point. And I was just insanely productive. <laughs> yep. There's, there's something about like being like low on stuff in your stomach where you don't, if you have a full feeling, I feel that I am generally way less productive. And so I try to yeah. just like keep my food intake relatively low throughout the day and like mm -hmm. have a big dinner or something. Um, yeah. But yeah. And just one extra question, just for anybody wondering how it's basically, I guess get to your level or even get hired by you or someone of your caliber, what would you kind of suggest to get, get to uh, that kind of level that you're looking for? Yeah, I would say going deep uh, on, so there's, there's a couple pieces here. I think going super deep and having a deep understanding of the EVM is super important, um, yep. you know, being able to just talk and look at something and understand, okay, this is actually what's happening under the hood is super important. And then really it comes down to time to build up that expertise. Um, but then not just the, okay, great. You have the understanding, yep. but being able to communicate that I think is a very underrated skill. Yep. So putting out a content piece about how you solved this CTF or, and just, putting your voice out there about mm -hmm. how you think will be one of the greatest things you can do for recognition and improving your chances of getting hired someplace mm -hmm. um, or, you know, at, at nascent or, you know, someone wanting to start a company with you, for example, mm -hmm. bringing you on as the CTO, that sort of thing. And so it comes from expertise, uh, time and putting your thoughts out there. Mm -hmm. I would even like to add to the the final point of basically putting your work out there. It also gives you a sense of mastery because if you can't convey it to someone in a meaningful way, do you really know it at, at that level? You should be able to basically explain it really easily, even if it's a com complex problem, or at least to some degree, that's easier than how you actually did it. At least that's what a thousand I, percent. That's what I've learned while doing all my stuff, like learning how to decode cold data, that was not easy. <laughs> that took me days to yeah. write that article. But now I'm at the point where I, I can explain it on the fly without like a graph. I can, you know, type of stuff. Yeah. So it's yeah. great for reputation, great for mastery, great for getting your name out there, which is opportunities, et cetera. So yeah, definitely go deep into something and do what people don't want to do because that's where yeah. it will yield to the most results. Um, An interview question I've, I've asked in the past is like, you know, what do you feel is a 
uh, one of your expertises and then, okay, explain it to me um, as simple as possible. And that mm-hmm. tells me so much about, all right, are they actually an expert in this yeah. and kind of can they communicate about it? Um, Mm -hmm. And so that is a very important skill. Yeah, communication, especially as a dev. If you're working with people that aren't devs, then you're going to have a hard time. (laughs) But yeah, Yeah, I I totally agree. But yeah, man, it's it's been such a pleasure. I think this was a a terrific conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I hope you did as well. Hopefully it wasn't like a normal conversation. You can finally express yourself in a nerdy way. (laughs) Yeah, I had a blast. Thank you. Of course. Um, Brock, Brock Elmore, everyone from NASSense. And make sure to look at Pyrometer. It could definitely help improve your dev experience and hopefully find some uh, some bugs along the way. But if you want someone else on the podcast, please DM me on Twitter at Degachi or at Scraping Bits or even send an email to scrapingbits at gmail.com and I'll review the person you sent. Otherwise... Everyone have a great day or night, depending on where you are. And thank you so much, Brock, for coming on once again. Thanks for having me.